Hey InfoSec Addicts, what's up guys? It's me, Joe McRae, again trying to help you guys out with the cloud. Today what I wanted to try and talk about was a little bit more of the cloud and really kind of where it's going. Now the thought process behind this video is it's going to be the precursor to getting more into how to penetration test stuff in the cloud. So we got to cover some cloud basics so that in later videos we can talk about how to pen test the cloud. So let's get started. So we'll start with virtualization and you'll hear people talk about virtualization versus emulation versus containerization. So right now you're going to hear a lot of buzzwords in our industry about Docker and Vagrant and Kubernetes and all these really cool things. But let's just kind of bring it down and let's start with some basics. So the first thing is you've got your hardware. So you've got your computer, it's basic hardware. And then you've got your hypervisor, and then you've got each individual virtual machine. We're going to call that a type 1 hypervisor. Now, most of you who are running VMware or VirtualBox are going to be used to a type 2 hypervisor, where you've got your laptop or your desktop. You're going to have an operating system that runs on it. And then you've got regular apps, Word, Excel, Outlook. Then you have an application, VMware or VirtualBox, and that application pretends to be hardware. This allows you to take a CD, and with that CD, you can point it at the hardware. So let's say I grab a marker and I draw a CD right here. So here's your Linux CD. And now you can point this CD right at VMware. And VMware will carve out a little bit of memory, carve out a little bit of processor from the hardware and say, let me just allocate this little bit of the hardware, right? A little bit of memory, a little bit of processor, right? Carve up some of that space. And then you can install your Linux in VMware. VMware is pretending to be an operating system. Hey, I'm a, a CD-ROM drive. Hey, I'm a network card, right? But it carves off some of those resources. That's why virtualization uses hardware. Virtualization uses hardware. So when you start hearing these differences between like VMware, Hyper-V, uh, Virtual PC, uh, and then we start hearing about things like Kimu, where they're talking about, no, no, something like this does emulation. Kimu, KVM, right, versus virtual PC, uh, uh, Hyper-V, VMware, Virtuoso, you know, Parallels. You're going to start hearing people talk about the argument between virtualization and emulation. With virtualization, he actually carves off a little piece of the hardware and says, let me carve off this piece of hardware and run a virtual machine. With emulation, he has a virtual memory space, right? Some, some space in RAM, and I will pretend to be whatever hardware you want. This is how you can run old games. Everybody wants to play like really old games like from Atari and stuff like that. You run those in an emulator. So software pretends to be the hardware that you used to run these old games on. And that's going to be the difference between virtualization, right, which actually uses a slice of the hardware, and emulation, where in the software, the software pretends to be the hardware. Okay? So virtualization is going to be great. Where you might need emulation is maybe you want to run something that's made for Spark on a machine that's actually Intel hardware, or you want to run a really legacy application that doesn't run on this hardware. You're going to need emulation for that. So here your hypervisor in a type 1 is your VMware, your Hyper-V, your, your, well, it could be VirtualBox headless as well, but here you're going from vMetal straight into your hypervisor. So you have your server and you don't install an operating system. You install VMware or whatever your virtualization platform is. That's the difference. 
type one. Generally, you're going to see type one in your data centers. You're going to generally see type two, which is like what we do when we're using our laptop or our desktop. You're running Windows, Linux, or Mac. You've got regular apps, but you also run VirtualBox or VMware. And then the, v the virtual machines are housed in that. Now, the next thing I get asked about is like containers, Docker, Kubernetes, Vagrant. Okay, so what a container is, it's still basically a virtual machine, but what's happening is if you only have a finite amount of hardware, then you don't want to give everybody who uses your network infrastructure a full virtual machine, especially if everyone's going to run the same thing. If everyone's just going to run a LAMP server, Linux, Apache, MySQL, then it might be easier to say, you know what, I'm just going to give everybody slices of this virtual machine. And that's really kind of what's going on with a container. Don't get me wrong, it's a little bit nerdier than that, but just so you kind of have a big picture where you go, okay, I just want to be able to give away slices of this virtual machine to everybody. And that's one of the reasons why containers are getting so popular, because now I can share the load across all these slices and I don't need to give up an entire VM and have so much unused resources. So you're going to find a lot of ISPs and CSPs, uh, internet service provider, cloud service provider, are really trying to move toward containers when they need to spin up really, really large distributed environments. That's why containers are getting so popular. So now that you got the basics of virtualization, and emulation and containerization, all that's happening is rather than it being in your data center, it's going to be in a data center somewhere else around the world. That's what takes us to the cloud. Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. What it boils down to is it's virtualization or emulation or containerization, and it's just not here. Right? So it's not down the hall in the data center. It's in another geographic area of the country or potentially another geographic area of the world. So now with infrastructure as a service, you're just giving me virtual machines, servers. I don't need to deal with hardware. Now, as far as configuring them, patching them and all that stuff, that's mine. So the headache you're getting rid of is hardware. I just log in and you give me virtual machines. I need more, you give me more. So the headache, I don't deal with hardware. I don't deal with power, right? I don't deal with, you know, any of that. I just play with my servers. So that's infrastructure as a service. So when you start dealing with the cloud, everything is about what headache you're helping me with. So I don't need to deal with servers. I mean, excuse me, hardware. Great. Just get my servers in play. The next one is platform as a service, P-A-A-S. Well, if I've got a dev team and I want to spin up a quick distributed dev environment for my developers all over the world, this is great. Now, what if we're Java developers and we need to port our application and test to see if our application can run in a Windows SharePoint environment or Ruby on Rails or something like that? We want to be able to do rapid prototyping. So what's beautiful about a platform as a service environment is you can quickly spin up different platforms, different environments. Maybe it's a Java dev environment with, with Glassfish and, 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 and Eclipse and all these different libraries. Maybe it's Ruby on Rails or maybe it's Django. I could spin up a whole environment, uh, Windows with SharePoint and all that kind of stuff. And me and my dev guys can just jump right in and start writing code. It's a great way for us to dev and test stuff out. A great way to rapid prototype and answer questions quickly about our business capability. Yes, sir or ma'am, we can do whatever this business goal is that you have. And that's amazing. The platform as a service, you're taking away my setup and config headache. I don't need to set up SharePoint. I don't need to set up Ruby on Rails. I don't, I don't need to set up Django and all the different library things that are associated with that. I just turn it on and it's gone. So you're giving me more than just servers. That setup and config headache is gone. That's why people like platform as a service. And the last one is software as a service. So you just want to work. I just want to jump right in 
and work. So with software as a service, you set me up so that I just log in and use the app to do whatever it is that I want to do. I just work. You can't get any freaking better. Like you can't beat that with a stick. Bro, I just jump right into the app and work. I need to add new users, log in, create new users. I don't need to do anything else. I don't have to deal with servers. I don't have to deal with config, I'm, nothing. I just let my users work and I pay the bill. You can't beat software as a service. So now let's wrap that up with finally, how do you secure cloud environments? Securing cloud environments at a high level comes down to just a couple of things. So the first thing is asset management. With the cloud environment, you can quickly provision and deprovision. So you can spin up stuff, right? If you look at these, I can quickly spin up and spin down stuff. So the big thing for you is gonna be asset management. How many machines do I got out there? And what the heck are these machines doing, right? So you gotta be able to really keep track of what's out there. So when you're doing your audit, the first thing you wanna figure out is do they have really good asset management? Can they tell you what's being provisioned and decommissioned right, at any given time, right? The next thing we wanna know is vulnerability management. Well, without good asset management, you can't do good vulnerability management. I always tell my students, if you don't know what you have and where it's at, it's not yours. So we've got to be able to figure out where our stuff is in the cloud. How many servers we got? What kind of servers are they? How are they configured? And then because we know that, we can now track vulnerabilities in the environment. What vulnerabilities do we have? SQL injection, cross-site scripting, unpatched servers. That's all part of vulnerability management. Coupled with vulnerability management is configuration management and change management. What have we deployed? How is it configured? And anytime there's a change to it, you know, are we tracking and making sure that those changes are authorized by somebody who's, you know, preferably is going to put their neck on the line, right? An executive of some sort. So we want to make sure that we've got asset management, vulnerability management, config and change management. We got to have that. Then we get to the next stuff, encryption. We have to have encryption in transit and at rest. We have to have encryption in transit and at rest. So if data's just sitting around on disk, even if it's a virtual disk, regardless of where it is in the world, we definitely want to have um, we definitely want to have encryption. If data is moving, data's in transit, we definitely want to have encryption. Okay? The next thing that we want to have is called IAM, Identity Access Management. Identity Access Management is, do we have a mechanism to ensure that whoever is accessing these servers, all right, or these applications, we have a way that we can confirm we know who these people are, right? So we want to make sure that we've got really good identity access management. The next thing that we want to know is, do we have DLP, and digital rights management. I'm actually gonna throw one more thing in here. And that one more thing that we should have, you wanna make sure that you've got digital, excuse me, data loss prevention. Data loss prevention is what allows me to know when I have data that's, you know, credit card numbers, social security numbers, stuff like that. Anything that uh, critical data flying around uh, that I should or should not have flying around. That's really what you use uh, DL DLP for. Digital rights management is who's allowed to access that critical data, right? So you should have rules on not just who can access the server or the app, but who's allowed to access what type of data, right? And where this data should be, like who can print it, who can copy it, all that kind of stuff. And then the last most important thing is geofencing. If that's critical, to your business, obviously this is if it makes sense. If it's critical to your business, you want to be able to ensure that certain data can only go to certain geographic regions of the world. We do that with geofencing. Then the last thing I would be looking at are logging and intrusion detection, right? So make sure that the servers are configured for logging, the applications are configured for logging, the databases are configured for logging, and we've got some sort of intrusion detection in there, right? 
So now that we've got intrusion detection, the last thing that we want to have is good network segmentation. We need to ensure that we can track, uh, not just track, but separate the different components within the network. So you know, you've got certain network regions separated uh, for next network regions, and this network segmentation is going to be for both security and for availability, right? This is what allows for load balancing across different geographic regions of the world. I find that this really makes sense. This is what you're going to use for disaster recovery, right? How you set up coop sites and, you know, failovers and things like that. That's what that network segmentation is going to be for. Guys, the thought process here was just to give you a real big high level of cloud and we're going to get into some little bit more technical stuff in another video later on. I need you guys in the comments write down if you found this helpful and then we want to get into subjects like pen testing cloud stuff, pen testing big data solutions. And I want to talk about some more technical stuff but I need to hear from you. What kind of stuff do you want me to talk about? Do you want me to go deeper into this kind of stuff, right? Virtualization, emulation, emulation, containerization, attacking these types of things, or do you want to talk like uh, attacking infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, offer as a service, like specific types of cloud-based apps, like where do you want to go? I've had people ask me about cloud security, but I haven't had real good specifics on what they want to know in cloud security. So if you can give me a little bit more of what you want to learn, then I can go a little bit deeper. All right, guys, be sure you subscribe to the channel. If you already haven't, be sure you write down in the comments below, what do you want me to talk about as it relates to the cloud? All right, guys, see you in our next video.